Hello everyone, this is another episode of the Context Coffee Chat. Today I will be talking to Hedvika Michnova about her climate and coffee documentary. And there she is. Hi. Hello, <laughs> welcome. And thank you so thank much you. for joining. This was very prompt. I think that was the quickest Insta Live session setup I've ever done. Um, let's start by introducing you. Um, and, you know, I, I could do it, but I think you'll do a much better job. So uh, why don't you uh, tell the world out there who you are and uh, what you do and what you've accomplished? <laughs> so um, I'm Hedvika. And uh, I'm from the Czech Republic, but I moved to the UK a couple of years ago to go study a great course called Marine and Natural History Photography. And uh, that kind of got me into filmmaking. And as I was uh, planning to do my final film for my, uh, for my final year at university, I decided that I wanted to make it about coffee, which is uh, why we're here today, because for the past year I've been creating this documentary about the impacts of climate change on coffee production, which led me to this incredible journey on coffee plantations, meeting many wonderful people. But uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that in a bit, in a minute. But yeah, uh, since accomplishing the film, I've had it presented at many festivals around the world, hoping to spread the message as wide as I can. And yeah, I currently live in Bristol in the UK, where I work for a wildlife production company, which uh, I love. <laughs> So yeah, that's me. It's, uh, I mean, uh, I told you before, I think it's it's just mind blowing uh, what you put together, but also I'm just so, so happy to see how successful uh, you've been with with uh, your film and you know, that it ultimately I'm sure uh, contributed to you uh, getting that dream job right out of uni, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's definitely been a great experience and uh, I kind of like, I never took the film as a sort of a student project for me. I was always wanting to make it something, something more, something that I could present to people and hopefully make some sort of impact with. But yeah, uh, I do think that it actually helped me get my dream job and I'm very happy about it. Definitely, definitely. Uh, the film is called It's Been Too Hot, which I think is a marvelous title to start with. <laughs> and, um, I mean, other than just raking in awards at uh, this season film festivals. I, don't, I, I stopped counting at some point, but it must must be at least, what, 10, 12 oh, no. like at this time? <laughs> <laughs> I had presented at quite a few festivals, but it only won several times. Well, only. I'm very, <laughs> you know, it's not for sure, but uh, it, it is great to kind of uh, see the appreciation and see that somebody kind of gets the message that I wanted to convey in the film. It's just, yeah, yeah the best thing that could happen with that. Definitely, very, very cool. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the film is about coffee and climate change and um, conversation, uh, conservation uh, uh, at the end of the day, right? And how to mm. accomplish a more sustainable way of, of growing coffee and, and getting climate proof essentially uh, in, in our industry. Um, and yeah, why don't, why don't we start um, by you um, painting a bit of a picture of what you found in the run up to the actual filming, your research, and then obviously through your experiences traveling to mm. origin in Tanzania and Costa Rica as well. How is yeah, definitely. impacted by climate change? Sorry? How is coffee growing impacted by climate change? <laughs> Well, that for me was a kind of big shock to uh, to find out because, uh, like I was chatting to you recently, I have been interested in coffee for quite a few years, but, uh, you know, like uh, any sort of barista would kind of trying to find out how different coffee coffee tastes and so on. But then uh, as I was trying, to, as I was trying to figure out what to make my film about, I got into researching more about coffee and more about how it actually grows. And that's why I found an article that coffee production could decrease by 50% by 2050, which uh, I just thought was insane. So I researched more and more about it and found how coffee is really sensitive to climate change and sensitive to changes in temperature. Essentially, coffee only grows at this area called the coffee belt, which is essentially in the tropics. And 
and can only grow in southern altitude and it's very sensitive to temperature so if the temperatures go much higher it will not produce as much and if it will go lower like it did in Brazil last year the coffee the coffee plant can freeze and uh, again uh, the production is not going to be as high so what is happening to coffee farmers around the world is that the suitable areas for growing coffee are going much much higher to, into a higher altitude and obviously that creates a lot of problems because it is expensive for farmers to move to just move their farms up the hill but they cannot be doing that forever and also uh, sometimes it's a difficult issue because of topography and everything so a lot of farmers are not able to produce their coffee like they used to so they have to adapt to it another big issue uh, because of climate change is that there's a big spread of diseases and pests which impact coffee plants for example uh, I saw a lot of coffee leaf rust especially in Costa Rica where, um, as I was speaking to one farmer, he was saying that coffee leaf rust uh, once did a big kind of an issue in Asia and then it just spread around the world and now it's spreading to their area as well and it's spreading much quicker than it normally would and that's because of climate change. So yeah, a lot of issues that these farmers uh, that have been growing coffee for generations in the same way are just not sure on what to do with it and they're afraid they might lo lose their whole production. So yeah, I thought a film like this needed to be made to kind of make, make people aware about the issue because uh, as consumers I think we barely ever think about where our coffee comes from and what might be happening to it. So I wanted to draw that like link between the consumer and the producer. Yeah, which, you know, I absolutely applaud and I love the notion because I, I agree. I mean, that's my experience as well, um, even though people, you know, my customers love coffee, they love drinking coffee. And yeah. um, I always think it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting how particular a lot of people are about, especially their morning coffee and, you know, how they like it and how they don't like it. Mm -hmm. and, and so people do have strong opinions about their coffee, but it is one of those products that is just so every day that most people yeah. don't really think about where it comes from. Yeah, we, or, we don't give it a second thought. Yeah. It's just uh, this great drink that <laughs> kicks you up in the morning and you're ready to work and th that's it really. Yeah, but it is in fact an uh, agricultural product. So it is grown on a tree as a fruit <laughs> in the tropics. Yeah, it's a fruit. That, that is the thing. Like a lot of people don't know that it's actually a fruit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so just, just to you know, give us a clearer picture of, let's, let's focus for a second on, on the issue of um, coffee leaf rust, um, mm. which is one of the most, um, you know, common threats uh, to, to coffee, uh, to grow, growing coffee and to coffee um, yeah. production. Um, you've seen it live. <laughs> what, what does it look like and what does it do to the plant? Um. What it looks like is essentially how it sounds. It looks like there's this rust on the coffee leaves and uh, it spreads around the whole plant and the leaves start, fa leaves start falling. So if it's not treated, all the leaves of the coffee plant are going to fall off and the coffee is not going to pr produce cherries anymore. It's a fungus, that is... isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm yeah. definitely not a specialist, but uh, you, c you can see it on some of the plantations and you just know like that is not good. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because it. I mean, once it's there, it's really hard to keep it at bay, isn't it? And and uh, it can spread yeah. very quickly, very easily. And just yeah, and the problem is that uh, farmers are kind of most farmers are treating this by just uh, spraying chemicals on the coffee plants, which is harmful for many reasons. But it's also like not a long-term solution. So a big part in the film is also how we can grow coffee organically, how we can, how it can be more healthy for us drinkers, but also for the people that grow it, who have to handle the chemicals. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that, that um, I mean, we're getting right into, into the topic. You've, uh, in order to put your film together, you've traveled to Costa Rica and met coffee mm. farmers there and, and had a look um, at, at what they do in Costa Rica. They are actually um, very far ahead uh, compared to many other coffee growing regions in the world when it comes to 
you know, different approaches to climate proofing their production and um, making it more sustainable, but also in terms of technology, I believe. Uh, and yeah, definitely. As well, so maybe you can um, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about um, different approaches in different regions as well, right? Yeah, it was a big difference between Costa Rica and Tanzania for well, many, many reasons. Costa Rica is a fairly rich country and uh, when it comes to coffee production, it is quite sophisticated. Like, I visited the first carbon neutral coffee farm in the world that was in Costa Rica. So you see how far their technology and how far they're progressing in this sort of thinking of adapting to climate change, but also like being less harmful to the environment and how they're producing. Uh, in Tanzania, coffee production is also different because uh, it's usually very, very small farms. It's uh, almost like coffee gardens that a family has that they use to like sustain their livelihoods. And uh, the approaches are different, not only between these two countries, but also in various regions as well, or in various, uh, even quite small areas. One farm, uh, a solution that works for one farm might not work for the other and so on. Uh, in Costa Rica, the main thing I focused on was filming shade-grown coffee. Shango coffee is essentially uh, coffee uh, where you grow fig trees under it and also it works like a forest, it's really beautiful <laughs> and uh, it works in many beautiful ways because not only the trees protect coffee from the heat, they also attract birds uh, and birds are great in uh, eating insects on the coffee plants so they help them with pest control and it's this beautiful like, ecosystem that just works. Of course, that can work for every farm. For example, if your farm is too uh, high up in the hill and too high altitude, you don't want that much shade because the coffee wouldn't produce as much. Uh, but yeah, the, from uh, speaking to Guillermo, uh, this great farmer in Costa Rica, that is like the main character in my film, he was kind of trying to employ this concept of shade grown coffee, but he was growing the trees around his coffee farms so they would still kind of uh, be uh, good for the birds, good for the environment, but then his plants also got a bit of the sun, which he needed. So yeah, it's a different adaptation for every farm, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, in, in your film you have these, um, these beautiful shots uh, from above, right? Where you can really see how Guillermo has created these parcels of land, essentially, that are framed by yeah. shade trees, and then the coffee uh, trees sit within that parcel and they get um, sun at different times of the day but shade at other times and um, i can see you watch it <laughs> yeah yeah definitely <laughs> yeah no, ex exactly as you're saying but uh then i went to some farm which was much uh, lower altitude mm -hmm. so it was very much uh, just a forest and it was absolutely beautiful and you see that like the the reason why some farmers don't want to go to shade grown coffee is because the plant will produce a bit less because like coffee likes the sun. It doesn't like too much of it, but it does like the sun, so it produces quite a bit. But uh, when you have it in shade, there is not as much. But then uh, the thing is that those coffee plants will last you much much longer. Mm -hmm. So it pays off uh, in the long term. But that's why like some farmers are kind of skeptical and not wanting to switch to that because they're like, well, I'm not going to have that much this year. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, for the environment. It's, a, it's a balance act, isn't it? Where you have yeah, to, exactly. because I, I suppose, you know, if, if the tree is in full sun all day long, it will produce more, but that also stress to the plant. And so um, mm -hmm. the tree won't survive or won't have as long a life. But if you kind yeah. of shelter it a little bit, um, it will produce less you know, every every given year, but then it will produce longer. And so, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess yeah, and co strategic. coffee plants, take, sorry, coffee plants take several years to first actually start producing cherries. Mm -hmm. So constantly replanting is very difficult for the farmers. Yeah, yeah, it has to be a strategic long-term sort of uh, thing to think about. Mm. And, um, yeah, I, I suspect, um, I don't know what you found, but um, Guillermo seemed to be a, a conservationist for one thing, but he also seemed to be a community leader in, um, in, his, 
in his area where he lives and grows his coffee. Um, mm. um, what what kind of support do uh, do these farmers get from the government or from other organizations? Maybe that because it's a, it's an it's a, a topic of access to knowledge as well, isn't it? If you have to think about the long term yeah. plan for the future, especially with sustainability and climate change being something that has only become more urgent over the last, mm -hmm. um, well, I guess for farmers, maybe longer than for, for us in everyday life, right? But still. Yeah, th I'm not sure what kind of support they get from the government in general. I suppose it's very different uh, anywhere you go. But uh, like you said, it's really important to have that access to knowledge. And especially in Tanzania, where these farmers, they see that uh, the rains have been decreasing, it is getting hotter, there is not that many trees around that would protect them anymore because they've been cut down and they see that they're not producing as much but they don't really know what to do with it which is why in Tanzania I partnered with an organization that uh, was helping coffee farmers adapt to climate change and they were training them in practices that they could afford, practices that anyone could do are not very expensive but in the long term they would ha help them uh, save their coffee plants. Mm -hmm. And what kind of practices um, are those in the case of Tanzania? Oh. <laughs> um, well, for example, I didn't include this much in the film because it's kind of difficult to portray it in an artistic way, I would say. But uh, in Tanzania, they were uh, doing a lot of mulching, mm -hmm. essentially putting uh, dry sticks on the ground so that the soil would be healthy. There was a lot of practices that had to do something with the soil, so they wouldn't have to do, and they wouldn't have to use as many chem as many chemicals. Their plants would last longer. Um, they a, a lot about it. A lot of it was about uh, trying to keep water within the farm because it was getting drier and drier, and especially in Bea in Tanzania, you could see how some of the coffee plants were just completely dry from previ previous seasons and just wouldn't produce anymore so they were building these like ridges to kind of keep water in the farm and yeah you see these practices are something they could do but they do need someone to give them that knowledge and the great thing was that HRNS the organization was actually uh, training the farmers to be the trainers so that uh, the farmer that would then go and train his neighbors so everyone could keep producing yeah like a multiplier effect, basically, yeah. Yeah, and you could definitely see like the difference between the farmers that uh, were implying these practices and those that weren't. You could see how some farmers just looked healthy, they were very profitable, and you could see that they were doing well. <laughs> Which is, uh, yeah, it's great to see that it actually works and can be done. I think it's very reassuring to hear that um, at least some or hopefully even the majority of the practices they apply are fairly low tech. They, they are practices that, mm -hmm. that can be easily and quickly apply, be applied and make a big, big difference in terms of the health yeah. of the plantation, but also the yield, I would imagine, that the yield um, goes up and they actually have more coffee to sell. Yeah, absolutely. Also uh, in Tanzania, what I didn't mention, what they were doing quite a lot, is kind of employing the practice of shade grown coffee but uh, obviously if you want to have coffee in a big forest it's going to take you several years but what they were doing is they were planting bananas on the coffee farm which was good for two reasons providing the shade but then also the family would not depend on coffee itself they would be able to sell bananas in different seasons because coffee only produces cherries uh, once a year so for the rest of the year they kind of depend on uh, on that so by being able to sell bananas throughout the year, they're also able to kind of keep their livelihood and st still keep farming coffee, but yeah, not having to go completely something else and leave their farm. Yeah. All right. Um, so in terms in terms of the different challenges you've seen, just to sort of summarize and reiterate, in Costa Rica, um, it was, you know, a big threat was coffee leaf rust. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially pests and diseases that affect the coffee plant uh, uh, itself, but also um, in, an increase in, in uh, heat and temperature and sun, obviously. Um, yeah. Um, and then 
um, how, what's the water situation in Costa Rica? Um, it was definitely better than in Tanzania. Uh, I would say, I'm not an expert in this, but I would say that the impact of climate change there was not as severe. It could be because they were doing kind of a better job at protect, protecting their farms. But in comparison to Tanzania, where you could just see how the land was completely dry, the plants were dying off, uh, very, very different. Um, there are a couple of, there are a lot, of, sadly, pests and diseases that affect coffee. There's this, uh, it's called coffee berry borer. It's this tiny beetle that climbs into the coffee cherry before it's ripe and then just eats it from the inside. And the farmer essentially doesn't know about it until the end, until they pick the coffee cherries and they just crumble. <laughs> and that's something that you encountered in uh, Costa Rica as well, or in Tanzania, or both? Or uh, I've seen that in Costa Rica as well. These problems are sadly global. Yeah. But the thing why I went to Tanzania was uh, because in Costa Rica I saw mainly the environmental challenges. You saw the, the pests, the diseases. But then in Tanzania there's a big issue about uh, climate change kind of increasing the gap between men and women and less women being able to do coffee farming as a business mm -hmm. because uh, in Tanzania and in these uh, countries most of the coffee is actually like picked by women, most of the labor work but women are rarely involved in making the decisions for the family and actually selling the coffee, going to the market with it and having kind of their own business and because of climate change women have to spend more time kind of providing for the family they have to travel further to get water, they have to find uh, dry wood to, to make fire and uh, it kind of makes life more difficult for them. So what the organization was doing was that uh, they were trying to make life for women easier in the way that they would give them water tanks, they would give them uh, these stoves that were very efficient so that they wouldn't have to spend as much time doing uh, these things, trying to find water and so on when they could actually focus on uh, being more involved in, in coffee. And it was really good to see like how the families learned to work together and really learned to kind of embrace it as a family business. Yeah, and um, in, in your film it seemed like, because you interviewed some of the, uh, the men of the households, right, uh, who, who take care of, of the business of the coffee plantation, so to speak, um, and towards the end, um, some of them did actually point that out, right? That through working with uh, the Hans Neumann Stiftung, that's the organization mm -hmm. you referred yeah. to earlier, um, um, that, you know, their harvest and, and their way of making a li living has become more um, collaborative and they mm -hmm. see the value that the women bring to, uh, to the operation. And, um, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, women, there was there was this great woman, and she was saying like women pick coffee very well. They do it very gently. They get uh, they are able to do this if they get the chance. There was this uh, this guy I interviewed, and he had two wives, and uh, both of his wives were working on the farm with him. And it was really good to see how they all work together, and it worked like that. But saying that you don't see that very often. It was very, very difficult for me to actually find a woman farmer that we could talk to that would already be like empowered this way. Mm -hmm. Most of the people we spoke to were men farmers and the women were doing the traditional role of a woman, which hopefully it is going to progress in some way in the future. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I mean, Tanzania and Costa Rica are two uh, coffee growing countries of I think it's over 140 countries uh, where coffee is grown. And um, you might more, know more about that than me. <laughs> <laughs> and gender inequality is, is a huge uh, topic, a huge issue in, in every single one of these countries. I mean, it, it's a problem here in this country as well, right? In, in Western countries too. Uh, just, uh, it just presents in different ways, I would, I would think and I would say. But I, I do keep hearing uh, from, you know, from the origin side of the value chain, I do keep hearing um, that coffee that is um, produced by women tends to have 
slightly higher quality than <laughs> coffee that is <laughs> only by men. Um, there, you know, there's speculation as to why that might be, but maybe mm. um, women tend to be a bit more delicate or a bit more thorough in, in fulfilling oh, maybe. the after. You know, this is speculation, pure speculation, but I think um, it's one of those examples where, um, you know, maybe people who just joined this conversation might wonder, I, I thought this was about climate change, why are they talking about gender inequality? Um, but, you know, how these topics are so connected is, is mm. you know, you have to kind of look at the big picture, don't you? Then women are traditionally um, tasked with the household domain and uh, have to take care of the family and the kids before they can uh, go and earn a living. And yeah. they have to spend much more time taking care of their household chores because, you um, distances that they have to bridge are are further to get to get water to get clean water or um you know as you said collecting collecting firewood and and these menial tasks that we don't even actually consider i guess uh, living a privileged life here in the west then yeah um, it is said that women are most impacted by climate change yeah yeah and many, many yeah people. it is something to be especially seen in countries like tanzania yeah very very different yeah, def I would imagine that definitely brought that point home very much, didn't it? <laughs> mm. <laughs> and I mean, since we're on the topic, uh, and, and you said that uh, there are massive differences between Tanzania and Costa Rica as coffee growing countries, um, is that a topic, gender inequality, or, you know, the different roles of men and women in coffee production that you did see in Costa Rica as well, on some level? Um. I'm not sure I can answer that. I wasn't completely kind of focused on the issue when I was in Costa Rica. Because when I first went to Costa Rica, I went there to film Shade Grown Coffee. And I was still very much learning about the whole coffee climate change issue. It was only once I got in touch with the organization, uh, HRNS in Tanzania, that I actually found about this and thought like the issue is even deeper than I, than I know, you know. <laughs> but saying coffee. that... I, I do know that in Costa Rica there were some like uh, women coffee associations that they were doing a great work on that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. <laughs> did you, with the farmers you did meet in Costa Rica, were there any women as well or did you meet mostly men? Is that something no. <laughs> in Costa Rica I only really spent time on two farms. One was uh, Guillermo's farm, like we talked about him before. And the other one was the first the carbon neutral coffee farm in the world. Yeah. And uh, when I was there, it was uh, not a great time in terms of the pandemic. I barely got access to any of the locations. And uh, a lot of people were worried about uh, letting me actually go there. So some just let me go like visit the farm, but not actually speak to anyone, which was a big shame. But, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, you know, doing this, doing this documentary in a time of global pandemic was an extra layer of challenge on top, right? <laughs> that, that no, it, it, definitely a big challenge, but it was doable and nobody got COVID during the time, so I'm very happy about that. <laughs> I mean, at least nobody from our production. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Good, good. Um, maybe, um, I mean, you know, questions obviously are always welcome from the audience, but uh, I'd be interested to go into some of the details of um, the solutions you encountered to the challenges of climate change um, in, in both countries. I mean, you, we already touched briefly mm. on the topic of shade grown coffee in Costa Rica and um, why those trees make sense. Yeah, but maybe because one one of the things that um, you know were were like a little bit of a ha moment, moment even for me watching your documentary and you know I say even for me meaning that I have some background in coffee and yeah. I do know some things. Um, <laughs> you know, there you can you I I don't think you can ever know everything about coffee. That's what I love about yeah. it. <laughs> but even as someone who um, who has some background knowledge. Um, um, I had heard about bird-friendly coffee before, and that's you know one of those terms that just float around in the industry. 
but to see like the actual reasoning and the connection um, in in your um, in your piece about Costa Rica was was really really interesting to me. Maybe you can sort of uh, get into that a bit more. Yeah, um, bird friendly coffee. Uh, it's a certification that uh, actually the farm that I filmed didn't have <laughs> because uh, it needs to the coffee needs to be grown organically and uh, it needs to be grown in the shade it needs to support the life uh, around and it means that the trees on the coffee farm provide a great sort of nesting space for migratory birds and uh, those birds like I mentioned before they also then help kind of the farmers with pest control so uh, the farmer doesn't need to use pesticides and it actually can grow coffee organically um, there is a lot of coffee certifications, you know, like organic, shade grown, uh, fair trade and so on. But uh, what I found in Costa Rica, what I didn't expect is that it's actually really difficult for the farmers to achieve them because it comes with really big costs. For example, like I said, the farm that I filmed, they didn't have the certification bird friendly coffee. And that was because they didn't have organic certification first, even though they uh, weren't using chemicals, they were, they were doing everything really well. It is difficult for them to kind of obtain that because it would mean that they would need to go take down all, take out all the trees that they have on the farm. They would need to kind of uh, re replant them and wait for the soil to kind of get completely clean to make sure that the no chemicals there are still, still in it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a kind of a difficult thing with the certifications, especially with certifications like fair trade. I would say, because fair trade is a great thing. It assures that the coffee farmer is going to get a good price for their coffee. But the problem is that people aren't usually used to buying fair trade coffee. They're not used to paying more just because of like the social aspect of it. Because fair trade coffee doesn't taste any different. You're just paying more. To give more to the farmers so a lot of people would, wouldn't buy that yeah. so what actually happens uh for for these farmers is if their coffee doesn't get sold as fair trade they sell it on the lower price not as fair trade so it's something that still kind of needs to work in a slightly different way yeah. so we are more kind of encouraged to pay pay more for the coffee and actually do care about the producers yeah yeah, I mean, the certification scheme still put um, the, the biggest part of the responsibility on the farmers, uh, as you said, right? Mm. So they have to make sure um, the conditions on their farms are up to the standards the certifications ask for. And um, then they have to pay to get certified. They have to pay for someone to come out and audit them, basically. And then that process has to be repeated uh, every so often. And they always, they have to pay for those recertifications essentially as well, right? So there is um, quite a bit of investment before they ever yeah. can get the stamp. It could be a big financial issue, Yeah, for sure. So, but then one farm I was speaking to in Costa Rica that was uh, organic, it was a very small coffee farm. And they did say that they decided to go organic because as a small coffee farm, it gives them uh, less kind of competition on the market mm -hmm. so that their coffee could be sold at a better price but also they could like stand out in something and they were very happy doing that yeah i mean it does give you give them access to a different segment of the market essentially right i think that mm. that's the other aspect of it if they have the certification then um they can sell to to customers that other farmers can't even though they might be implementing the same practices right <laughs> Um, like, like the farmer you, you spoke with. Yeah, um, we yeah exactly. Have, we have a question I think. that relates to, to the topic. Nick asks, are the big coffee companies contributing much to responding to the issue or is it pretty much down to the farmers? Is that something that you've come across? Uh, um, so um, basically 70%, I think, of the world's coffee is grown by smallholder coffee farmers. So they are quite small farms that then uh, they sell their coffee to cooperatives that, that gets then gets sold to the bigger companies. Uh, what was really good to see 
is that uh, companies like Starbucks, Slovatsa, Tim Hortons, they actually co cooperate with uh, Hans Arnoyman Stiftung, the company that uh, the organization that I was working for that is helping farmers uh, protect their farms from climate change. So it's good to hear that they are actually trying to do their mm -hmm. bit, I hope, in uh, changing the issue. But obviously, these big farms uh, that you see mostly in Brazil, they are a big problem because they are absolutely massive. Uh, there's a lot of chemicals on them. It's very different to these like, tiny ecosystems you see, you see in the Shea Grown Coffee Forest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, um, there is no easy answer to that question, Nick, because it's very different from origin to origin. <laughs> um, mm. and also from big coffee company to big coffee company. Um, most of yeah. the um, really big names have sustainability programs where they, are, where they um, support um, projects at origin and they invest fairly heavily in, in some cases as well uh, into initiatives uh, to make mm -hmm. the value chain more sustainable um, and things like that. But it is a very complex issue, a very complex situation. And um, so I think, yeah. As yeah, it really is. In like, development work, you have to, the impulse has to kind of come from within, basically, to really make things sustainable. People who, um, who live with the challenges need to um, implement solutions, be part of the solution and um, sort of embrace it. Um, but, but yeah, I think as, as the consuming side of the value chain, we need to give our support in, in other ways. We need to, we need to take responsibility for um, for the issues to, uh, of growing coffee. Um, mm -hmm. You know the consequences at origin as well. Yeah, and I would definitely like yes, these companies are contributing money towards sustainability, but I would always still recommend to going to rather like small coffee shops rather than those big chains. The one thing is that. The larger coffee chains usually have the cheapest coffee that there is. They have a sort of a mixture, even though it might be Arabica. But it's usually from Brazil, where it's not exactly grown very sustainably. It's full of chemicals. And uh, what I was wanting to say before is that uh, these small like roasteries are the ones that usually have the direct contact with the farmers. So often they visit them, often they know exactly who who's growing that coffee and uh, they really pick the best ones there and know the, how the farmer is actually, how the farm works, you know, if it's, if it's a farm that actually works in a sustainable way or not. Well, I mean, I can only second that, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're looking here and defend big coffee companies, for sure. Um, I think the main difference between how big coffee companies source their coffee and how small companies um, source their coffee is the commodity market. So big coffee companies uh, buy all or most of their coffees anyway through the commodity market where it's traded at, um, at prices that are just not sustainable due to how the commodity market works and how trading uh, works essentially. Whereas smaller companies um, like myself or even beyond that, um, special, specialty coffee importers and exporters they work hand in hand with the farmers, and mm -hmm. you know, even in Brazil, where I um, I agree with you, there are big issues in Brazil with these huge monoculture farms. But even yeah. in Brazil, there are many, many, many examples of initiatives and uh, programs mm -hmm. that do amazing work and that strive to change uh, the landscape in in Brazil when it comes to coffee. Um, um, and, and, you know, are at, at the forefront because Brazil is one of those countries that is economically a bit stronger than um, a lot of other coffee growing uh, countries. I think there's um, more economic capability as well to make, make those changes and lead the way to um, create a more sustainable mm. future for coffee as well. well yeah, that's really good to hear country. because uh, yeah. Brazil is the largest producer if they do start making the changes, then hopefully the coffee world will change a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have to, right? Otherwise, I mean, yeah. that's one of the big takeaways. From they lost film. so much coffee in the past year, uh, and it's hard to say what would happen if their farms could have worked 
in a in a different way if they're more organically. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the the um, issues in Brazil of the last year, they were. I mean, that's a, um, that's more or less a direct impact of climate change. There have always been because last year in Brazil, I think I mentioned it in one of the previous coffee chats. Um, when I was talking to <laughs> my uh, friends and uh, connections in Brazil, um, they've always had uh, uh, issues with seasonal frost and, and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, and that's exactly what happened last year, uh, you know, during the phase where the coffee sort of needs to, to the plant need to prepare to bear fruit. There were uh, a couple of days of, of severe frosts and the, but the issue there, it seems, is that uh, it's moving, right? The, as you said, the areas that are affected by these occurrences are shifting. And yeah. um, so that's, that's definitely something that, um, yeah, that the coffee world needs to prepare for, that these changes will occur probably more frequently, probably more severely, and, and they will also shift uh, from one region to another or affect bigger areas and and will be more mm. devastating going forward. Yeah, and essentially coffee might be much more expensive in the future. Someone I spoke to, I'm not sure I remember who it was, they were saying like, we will always have some sort of coffee, but it might not be as high quality as we have now. It might be those varieties like Robusta, which is also affected by climate change, but to a lesser extent that are just of lesser quality, they don't have those taste profiles that we're used to. And uh, the important thing is also like what's going to happen to the farmers, they, they might have to change to a different crop and completely change their lives. Yeah, yeah. Did you, did you I mean, about, about these uh, dynamics and issues, is that something that you talked to Guillermo about, for example, in Costa Rica? I mean, he, he is essentially climate proofing his farm by uh, uh, applying shade growing strategies and um, you know looking after the biodiversity essentially on his yeah. farm. Um, he was definitely trying to look to the future and make sure his farm kind of works on many different levels so he was not only protecting his coffee but he also knew that like uh, he could plant some sort of tree that he could make maybe some money from uh, in the future if the coffee was to fail. He also, they grow vegetables, they grow, they grow fruits on the farm. So they can kind of can sustain themselves in many different ways. It's not a monoculture, they, they have many different crops and they don't cut and forks together. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something you mentioned uh, for Tanzania as well, so diversifying the crop plan mm -hmm. um, is, is one big and important aspect of, um, well, on an economic level, uh, becoming more sustainable, so you have more income sources, but at the same yeah. time, um, I think in the segment about Guillermo, um, uh, you also uh, sort of showed that uh, by having animals on the farm and, you know, other plants and, and um, you know, managing the compost and the manure, um, mm -hmm. It becomes a circular idea where he can use these these materials to fertilize the coffee plantation, and uh, you know even even the coffee itself produces uh, compost yeah. in form of cascara, doesn't it? The the pulp. Yeah, the definitely can be composted. Yeah, and the, it's nice how they kind of reuse everything to put into like that their own fertilizer for. For coffee because they take soil from the forest they have they take uh like those like coffee pulp <laughs> and uh a lot of different things uh so they can make sure like to produce their coffee sustainably not use a lot of chemicals and use everything that they have so i do believe that farms like guillermo's would work for the future but then the climate is still changing and we don't know what might happen yeah so there's something to be, that needs to be done about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, let me see. Yeah, so basically from, from what you're saying, from, from your film, um, is 
the what I hear, what I take away from it is that the the threat that climate change uh, poses to coffee, coffee growing, um, are diverse and they also differ from region to region. But um, there there are hardly any regions that aren't affected by climate and climate change. <laughs> And especially yeah, uh, every power is affected by it in some way. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. And especially in the tropics, um, mm -hmm. that is and will become more and more of an issue. And I think as as it does as it does become an increasing issue, probably um, the the threats to coffee growing will also start to converge and become similar uh, in in the different regions. So. Um, probably the communication, the global communication about solutions uh, that are out there and that can be implemented um, will will be crucial for a lot, especially smallholder farmers who otherwise might not um, have as much access to education and to knowledge as uh, bigger farms and bigger companies do. Mm -hmm. um, and you've already mentioned Hans Neumann Stiftung that you collaborated with in Tanzania. Are there any other organizations out there that you've encountered during your uh, um, filming? Um, that would be not that I kind of know of or on such a big scale. There are like in places, especially like in Costa Rica, smaller like cooperatives and organizations that kind of do their work in that area. But what was good about uh, HRNS is that they're global. They work in Africa, in South America and in Asia. And they do different programs. They not only do uh, coffee and climate, which is the main thing I was there for, but they also do this program called Coffee Kids, where, where they try to get the younger generation to uh, start uh, start uh, growing coffee as well, because uh, that seems to be a big problem now as well. Also, that the younger generation doesn't kind of want to take over the farms. They want to go into the city and do different jobs. So... Uh, some farms might not have anyone to take care of them in the future, so they're trying to push uh, people into coffee farming a bit more. And yeah, do a lot of different things uh, just to kind of make lives of the coffee farmers better. And to, I, I guess, essentially to make it interesting for the younger generation to see a future in, in coffee farming, right? Um, yeah, for sure. They need to make sure that there is future there and there definitely is uh, even if uh, they are finding varieties of coffee now that might be more resistant to climate change so uh, farmers are replanting their farms of those if they can so there is some future there for them and they need to show them that and make them excited about it yeah yeah one of the organizations that's interesting with regard to um, to more resistant varieties of coffee is certainly world coffee research, because that's exactly mm. what they've dedicated themselves uh, to doing. Basically, they do um, genetic and you know bio research essentially into uh, the different uh, types of coffee that are out there and how how to um, mix and match <laughs> basically variety yeah. and how to to uh, climate proof the plant itself uh, on a biological level and then mm -hmm. distribute that knowledge and, and uh, well, the plants themselves as well on a global scale. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of organizations out there that do amazing work and not just global organizations either. There are a lot of um, cooperatives and collabor collaborative action um, in in the coffee green and growing countries as well, like uh, the the organization or the the um, company that I mentioned previously um, in in Brazil um, that I work with, mm -hmm. Coffee. Um, they started out as as a farm, uh, applying new, more sustainable, better practices on their own farm, and then neighbors uh, saw that they had success with the things they implemented and just wanted to learn more and and that grew into this uh regional uh conglomerate or not conglomerate right but a collaboration of of farmers and um mm. you know them supporting each other and and yeah 
bringing sustainable solutions uh, to their doorstep, basically. So there is there yeah, is hope. Very good. I think that's also the note that your film ends on, basically, which uh, which <laughs> made me happy. <laughs> what's the reason for yeah. hoping from your perspective? How did Sorry? The project, how, what's the reasons for hoping from your perspective? What what uh, kind of um, feeling did this year of, of coffee and climate research and filming leave you with? Um, I think the hope is there because I kind of, I saw it with my own eyes that the solutions that they're doing work. And uh, I also saw hope in the farmer's eyes as well. I spoke to them about how they struggled in the past uh, how, and how now because they changed things, they can uh, actually afford better living. So you see how much they, they actually value this help and how they hope that it's going to be okay for the future this way. Sure. Energy in, in there, you know, change yeah. is always That's scary right. as with everything, but it can also bring new energy to, to a system. And well, yeah, if we want a future for coffee, then we have to change things. Otherwise it is severely at risk, right? <laughs> Yeah, and they are fighting for it, and <laughs> that is kind of also what I wanted to show with the film to the consumers, that we might not think of those producers, but they are out there fighting for the future of coffee every day. Yeah, so um, <laughs> since, since you uh, said it, uh, you made the film because you wanted consumers to be more aware of these issues as well. What would be your kind of... Uh, suggestion then or what what do you think um, we as consumers can do to um, to you know trickle down support <laughs> to uh, yeah it, and... it is a bit complicated and I was trying to kind of find that throughout my whole journey like what can we actually do as consumers and uh, I think the most important thing is kind of like take more interest in the coffee coffee that you drink because a lot of people don't give it a second thought but uh, if you just reach for a different bag where you're in the store buying, buying coffee if you go for something that is sustainable organic fair trade then you're already making a difference to those farmers and if you kind of take an interest in where your coffee comes from maybe how does it taste and who actually grows it there if you're buying coffee from companies that have direct relationships with them it's always better than buying kind of the cheapest coffee in the supermarket that is probably the lowest quality that there is and wasn't grown in a good way that is not only harmful to the planet but also to you because it has a lot of chemicals in it so that is one way one way for sure just buying uh kind of those uh sustainable coffees but then you know, there are organizations that you can support like h harness that uh always kind of welcome any support they can get so they can keep doing what they're doing. All right. Well, it, it sounds like you've uh, kind of only opened that can of worms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <the time>. I know. <laughs> Do you think, can we hope for, for a, a second part of your amazing documentary? Do you think that's a topic that you might come back to at some point? <laughs> um, I don't know. I would like... I don't think I'm gonna leave this topic. I'm definitely still like reading around it. And there are more things like that has happened since I actually finished it. Like they're trying to grow coffee in a lab now and so on, which is, uh, but I would like to look at kind of different crops in the future as well. Cause it's not only coffee, like so many crops are affected because of climate change. If you think of chocolate, it's a very similar thing as well. So that might be a thing for the future. I don't know. <laughs> And we actually have the question if you already know what your next film project will be. And are you allowed to stay? <laughs> no. I got like a mix of ideas in my head, but I need to properly, you know, sit down and get, get to it. <laughs> right. no. Well, but last, la last but not least, uh, tell us where uh, we can actually see your film. Where can we see? Uh, stream it being too hot for <laughs> so my film is available to stream on water bear network uh, which is a worldwide uh, platform where you can stream for free a lot of uh, environmental and wildlife films usually very short ones so I would recommend just subscribing to water bear anyway 
for a lot of different a lot of different films. But yeah, uh, you should just go through I think it's Water Bear Network, and you can watch it for free there. <laughs> And since you are still uh, being nominated for festivals and things, I'm sure there will be live stream sessions uh, along the way. Uh, so if, if people yeah, for want sure. to follow your account, it's been too hot, then uh, they will be kept up to date, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. Right now it's at a festival in California called Wild and Scenic Film Festival, which is unfortunately online this year, like many of them are. But uh, if anyone was watching that, you could see there as well. Great. Well, yeah, if it wasn't for COVID, I'm sure you would be there now and uh, actually yeah. be able to receive the, the praise in person. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully going forward, that'll be possible. Um, maybe, maybe something more local. <laughs> yeah, or that, that would be even, even yeah. greater, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Um, do we have any more questions uh, for Hedvika? A minute or two? I think uh, we've talked about coffee a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, is, it is such a complex, uh, complex topic and, and a topic that, you know, will, will be changing so much in the years to come as well. As the yeah, it would be interesting to revisit that idea in a couple of years and see how it actually changed if yeah yeah i i bet for the better i'll i'll hold you to it <laughs> i'll get in touch in a few years and see see <laughs> whether you've uh, had a chance to go back and, and see what's happening ah, i would love to <laughs> yeah all right well thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today and uh thank yeah, you for thank you for having me to the topic as well uh, i think it's it's really crucial for the world and for you know us as end consumers as well to to know that these uh, issues are out there and that these things are happening and um, yeah we just don't talk about it enough do we so I think uh, it's amazing that you put together this really really beautiful documentary to showcase this specific issue and to bring awareness to to the sad but uh, true reality of uh, what coffee growing looks like uh, in the 21st century. <laughs> yeah, before, thank you for having me oh. and thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, well, I hope to see you soon. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I wish everyone a happy weekend. If you have any questions, just message me, message Hedvika. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, keep an eye out for live streamings of It's Been Too Hot. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. Hi. Bye, Hepika. Bye.